Hey, what's up, Stock Compounders? Brad here. So I set out on an ambitious project. The Most Important Thing by Howard Marks is one of my favorite investing books of all time. Uh, and I set out on a journey to synthesize each chapter into a tweet, okay? So I created a, a thread on Twitter with 20 different tweets kind of synthesizing the essence of 20 different chapters in this book, which really highlight 20 most important things uh, that we all as investors need to take into consideration. So I'm gonna go through uh, all 20 chapters in tweet form uh, in this video here. And uh, without further ado, let's dive in. <clears throat> so just to open it up, successful investing requires thoughtful attention to many separate aspects all at the same time. So we're gonna cover 20 of those aspects. The first one, second level thinking. It's not supposed to be easy. Anyone who finds it easy is stupid. Charlie Munger needs no introduction. To achieve superior investment results, you have to hold non-consensus views regarding value, and they have to be accurate. That's not easy. Uh, this really summarizes you know, superior investing. This is really the only way to beat the market over a long period of time. To differ from what everyone believes is true and also be more right than everyone else in that differing view of, of, uh, of the investments. So second level thinking. Uh, the second one, understanding market efficiency. The key turning point in my investment management career, this is Howard Marks talking, came when I concluded that because the notion of market efficiency has relevance, because the market is usually pretty efficient, I should limit my efforts to relatively inefficient markets where hard work and skill would pay off best. Of course, Howard Marks you know, made a career in distressed debt, uh, bonds where everyone else looks at them and thinks, clearly these are risky, okay? But of course, Howard Marks had the insight, well, you can't say that something is risky without telling me what the price is, okay? Value to price, and we're gonna get into this one, obviously. The comparison between value and price is what determines risk, okay? So uh, that's, you know, kind of a short backstory on why Howard Marks made his way into distressed debt uh, at Oak Tree. Value, for investing to be reliably successful, an accurate estimate of intrinsic value is the indispensable starting point. Without it, any hope for consistent success as an investor is just that, hope. Uh, now in this chapter, you know, they get into, as investors, we wanna buy low and sell high right? Everyone knows that. But what is low and what is high, okay? If we don't know what the value of something is, what the intrinsic value is, what a, what a share of stock is actually worth according to the fundamentals of the business, uh, then we have nothing to anchor low and high to. So uh, this is a hugely important point. If you don't know what something is worth, I mean, as an investor, you're really just floating in the ocean without any kind of life raft. Uh, the next one, relationship between price and value. I touched on this earlier. Investing is a popularity contest, and the most dangerous thing is to buy something at the peak of its popularity. Of course, we all see all of our buddies doing that. You know, it's just, it's, it's a crazy time in the markets where everyone seems to be piling on uh, the companies that have clearly won in the recent past. Uh, the safest and most potentially profitable thing is to buy something when nobody likes it, okay? And the reason for that, if nobody likes something, they've, they've sold, right? Investors are selling. That's, that's the predominant activity in the market for that particular company. Uh, and selling, when, when there's all of this selling happening, it drives the price down. 
And as humans, we tend to overshoot, right? Most investors don't have that anchor of knowing what something is worth. So once you get that selling engine ramped up, uh, it's more common than not for, for people to overshoot and actually uh, get more aggressive about selling than is warranted uh, by the underlying value of the company. So, um, you know, this, this is something that, you know, you see run rampant at the extremes of the market where as things get more and more popular, they get, they, they get bought up more and more. Um, and the same thing on the downside, when everybody's running away from something, it's very hard to move in the other direction, but that's actually the safest and potentially most profitable thing to do. Understanding risk. So, you know, the section of the most important thing on risk is just, this is really the bread and butter, in my opinion, of this book. Understanding risk. Risk means more things can happen than will happen, okay? Uh, look at Tesla, for example. So uh, anyone could look back and see what the price of Tesla stock has done over the last year, couple of years. It's, it's gone gangbusters. Uh, that's not to say that that is what was destined to happen with Tesla, okay? We don't know the probability that that particular outcome is was likely to happen, right? We don't know the probability. Um, and that's risk. It's very hard to really get a firm grasp about the prob probability distribu distribution of various outcomes. Um, you can't do it by looking back through history because you only see the one outcome that actually transpired. The performance of your portfolio under the one scenario that unfolds says nothing about how it would have fared under the many alternative histories that were possible. Something I think about a lot. Um, and it's, you know, it, it's a quantum leap to go from kind of the average investor to being able to gauge the probabilities of different outcomes. So uh, it really does require some serious second level thinking. And a lot of these chapters are intertwined with each other. So we're gonna see concepts coming up repeatedly, even in, in different um, most important thing uh, chapters. Recognizing risk. Risk means uncertainty about which outcome will occur and about the prob possibility of loss when the unfavorable ones do. The greatest risk doesn't come from low quality or high volatility. This is what most investors think. This is where they think risk comes from. Volatility, we're kind of taught in school that volatility is, is uh, equivalent to risk, which doesn't make sense. Um, and low quality. Something can be really low quality, and if it's cheap enough, it can still be a very attractive investment. The greatest risk comes from paying prices that are too high, okay? It's as simple as that. The greatest risk of losing money in your portfolio, permanent loss of capital, comes from overpaying for assets. Controlling risk. Risk, the possibility of loss, is not observable. What is observable is loss, and loss generally only happens uh, o generally happens only when risk collides with negative events, okay? So, you know, you can have all of the risk on in your portfolio. You can be leveraged to the hilt. You can be buying uh, assets that have a very low probability of going up from here. And it's possible that you're going to make a ton of money, okay? Uh, you're only going to know that somebody is putting on that risk if you don't have these particular insights to look at their portfolio and say, whew, that's really risky. You're only gonna know if something bad happens. And usually in the markets, uh, usually they're going up. Usually markets are going up, okay? Most of the time, if you look at, you know, the last hundred years in the stock market, you see 
you know, fairly long periods, maybe decade on average of rising markets. And then you'll see maybe a couple years of drops, okay? So you've really got to be careful about this. It's hard to see risk. It only shows up when these negative events occur. Over a full career, this is a very important point, over a full career of investing, the results of most investors will be more impacted by their losers than their winners, okay? And this is why Howard Marks, we're gonna talk about this later, uh, Oak Tree is really focused on just keeping up with the market during an up market and outperforming when it's a down market, when the market is doing poorly, okay? And again, we'll, we'll get into that later. But it's, it's why some of the greatest investors are so focused on the downside, so focused on avoiding losing money. Okay, rule number one, don't lose money. Uh, it reminds me of Warren Buffett, how when he was a kid, he changed his stride, right? The way he walked so that his knees were more bent, so that he was closer to the ground. And the reason for that, he was so focused on how to avoid falling, right? How to avoid accidents, taking a spill and toppling over, that he changed the way he walked to reduce the likelihood that he was going to fall, okay? That's how, you know, focused he was on avoiding the downside from a very early age. Being attentive to cycles. Uh, rule number one, this is a different rule number one than the one I just mentioned. Rule number one, most things will prove to be cyclical, okay? Cycles. Rule number two, some of the greatest opportunities for gain and loss come when other people forget rule number one. Um, you know, being tuned into cycles can really give investors an advantage. And we're going to talk about uh, how, how they can do that. Awareness of the pendulum. When things are going well and prices are high, investors rush to buy, forgetting all prudence. Then when there's chaos all around and assets are cheap, they lose all willingness to bear risk and rush to sell. And it will ever be so. Okay. This again, refers to how investing tends to be a popularity contest. Um, because investors don't know how to properly value what a company is worth. They tend to flock, right? Lemmings. They tend to move as a herd towards the things that are going up and move as a herd away from the things that are going, to down, going down, which is exactly the opposite of how we think about, you know, buying goods and services. If, if the price of a good or service goes down, we tend to buy more because uh, it's cheaper and we think we're getting we're getting more for our value. But the, that same thinking doesn't usually apply on Wall Street, even though, you know, there's no reason it shouldn't other than investors really don't understand uh, how to value assets in large part. Uh, combating negative influences, the desire for more, right? Uh, the fear of missing out, the tendency to compare against others, the influence of the crowd, the dream of the sure thing, okay? These are all kind of psychological tendencies that we have embedded in the experience of being human. These factors are near universal and have a profound collective impact on the markets. The result is mistakes, recurring mistakes, consistent mistakes, uh, frequent mistakes, okay? Many mistakes. Um, and so, you know, if, we, if we, we recognize that, if we recognize that these things are causing mistakes, we can learn to kind of step outside of the herd, the investing herd, and behave differently, okay? not allow ourselves to make mistakes or make the wrong decisions at the wrong times as a result of these influences. Contrarianism. There's only one way to describe most investors, trend followers. I just talked about that in the last tweet. Superior investors are the exact opposite. 
what's clear to the broad consensus is always almost always wrong okay the coalescing why is it wrong the coalescing of mass opinion behind an investment tends to eliminate its profit potential right if everyone thinks something is a great investment they will bid it up to a price where it is no longer a great investment because nothing is a great investment independent of price okay if you look at microsoft in the dot com bubble microsoft is a great business but if you bought microsoft at the peak of the dot com bubble it took something like a decade and a half okay 15 years to just get back to that same point where you would have bought uh, in the dot com bubble so uh, you need to consider price and uh, most investors don't know how to compare price to value I keep saying that which is why they follow trends because they don't know how to make intelligent decisions for themselves so they try to see what what's everyone else doing oh that that must be the thing to do even when that precise behavior is you know destroying whatever profit opportunity there is to that thing that everyone is flocking to uh, finding great finding bargains generally the greater the stigma or revulsion the better the bargain okay that's from seth Klarman, legendary value investor wrote the book margin of safety okay a fantastic book that's actually one of the others that is right up there at the top of of books um, on my investment shelf to boil it all down to just one sentence okay i love when great investors do this boil down to just one sentence the necessary condition for the existence of bargains is that perception has to be considerably worse than reality okay what happens when perception is worse than reality price gets driven far below what something is actually worth okay it's as simple as that and that's what creates bargain buying opportunities patient opportunism when there is nothing intelligent to do an intelligent investor does nothing sounds easy enough do not confuse action for being productive aha this is where people get into trouble uh, we learn throughout life that you know the more we do um, the the greater the payoff okay there's a direct correlation between activity and results uh, that's not true in investing okay uh, the most important attribute of a successful investor is extreme patience Okay, Monish Pabrai talks about how, you know, if you enjoy watching paint dry, investing might be for you. That, that's a really important aspect of being a great investor. And of course, it doesn't mean you have to do nothing, right? We can always uh, read, right? Charlie Munger, I mean, he's just this assembly line of books coming through, constantly learning. Uh, so there's always things to learn. But in terms of tinkering with the portfolio, um it may be you know more often than not that there's nothing intelligent to do there knowing what you don't know overestimating what you're capable of knowing or doing can be very dangerous in brain surgery trans ocean racing or investing uh, acknowledging the boundaries of what you can know and working within those limits can give you a great advantage this is really why, you know, Monish Pabrai, whenever he's asked about, you know, macro factors, the market, you know, these these things that he, he just flat out says, I, I don't, that, that's not going to give me an edge as an investor because I can't know that or it's, it's, it's too hard to know that uh, with, with any certainty that would lead to better decision making in the realm of investing. Uh, but when it comes to individual businesses, um, you know, it's possible to gain some kind of a, a knowledge edge there that can show up as outperformance in the portfolio. So uh, be humble, right? Acknowledge what you can know 
what is possible for a single human to know uh, and what's not knowable or not worth trying to know. Uh, so there, there's a lot there. Having a sense for where we stand. Now, this is a really interesting uh, chapter. It's not something I think about very often, but I'm starting to keep a closer eye on it. Sorry, guys, I'm just going to refresh this feed here so you can see my uh, dynamic mouth and, uh, and face as we navigate this. Having a sense for where we stand. As difficult as it is to know the future, it's not really that hard to understand the present. Okay? Very important concept. What we need to do is take the market's temperature. If we are alert and perceptive, we can use the behavior of those around us to guide us. And in this, Howard Marks puts a little... Um, uh, a little chart, basically, like a checklist almost, where, you know, we're to ask ourselves, what is the state of the economy? Is it vibrant or is it sluggish? And kind of figure out, you know, is it, is it skewed more to one end of that continuum? The outlook of the economy. Lenders, how eager or reticent are they to lend out money? Uh, and just go through. And if you find yourself having a lot of checks on the left side of this list, towards this column, uh, watch your wallet, says Howard Marks. Uh, and probably the, I think the, the advice here that Howard Marks would give is if you're on the left side of the column with most of these check marks, um, it may be a time for more caution in your portfolio. Maybe time to really focus on the downside. How do I not lose money? How do I protect the downside? And if most of the checks are in the right side, it may be time to be a bit more aggressive. Okay, uh, that's that's I think how Howard Marks would use uh, this chapter and where we stand given uh, these aspects of the market. Appreciating the role of luck, the keys to profit are aggressiveness, timing and skill. And someone who has enough aggressiveness at the right time doesn't need much skill. Okay, let that sink in a little bit. Don't let luck deceive you. So it's very easy to look at other investors who are being aggressive in, you know, a, a stage of the market that's, you know, been very frothy or it's, it's the market has been doing very well right when the market has been doing very well and you pair that with the investors who are very aggressive uh, what you see is people who look like investment geniuses when in reality there's there's a fair bit of luck there okay because if they had that aggressiveness during a time in the market that was not favorable markets were struggling uh, it would turn up it would show up very differently in their results. So learn how to discern between skill and luck. Okay. Uh, it's, it's, you know, something that's, that can be elusive. Uh, but if you know what you're looking for, uh, it's a lot easier to, to parse that apart. Investing defensively. There are old investors and there are bold investors. But there are no old, bold investors. And Greenblatt chimes in here in the most important thing. He says the same thing about pilots, uh, which you know, that, that would apply to pilots as well. Uh, of the two ways to perform as an investor, racking up exceptional gains and avoiding losses. Okay, those are two kind of ways to focus your investment efforts. I believe the latter can be done with greater consistency. Okay. Uh, focusing more on avoiding losses and in the you know exercise of avoiding losses the alternative if you're not losing money in the markets and you're really protecting yourself against losing money uh, good things tend to happen so yeah that's that's what Carl that's Karl Marx that's what uh, <laughs> that's what Howard Marx focuses on is how do we outperform in bad times 
and just keep up as much as possible in good times. Avoiding pitfalls. An investor need do very few things right as long as they avoid big mistakes, okay? This is from the greatest investor of all time. Uh, the greatest track record over the last, say, 70 years, okay, in Warren Buffett. Uh, so it's, it's a very humble statement, right? You don't need to do much right as long as you just don't do much wrong. Uh, and it really builds on the last thing about investing defensively. The belief that something can't happen, this is it's really sunk in when I read it. The belief that something can't happen has the potential to make it happen. As those who believe it can't happen engage in risky behavior and alter the environment. Think about housing in 2007, 2008. Nobody thought prices of houses could go down. Okay, so what that did is investors were leveraging, they were using all kinds of derivative instruments to bet on housing. And of course, the prices did go down. Okay, prices came down and everything blew up, right? Because investors were, were putting on an enormous amount of risk on this bet, on this belief that something couldn't happen. So that when it did happen, it was just mayhem. So keep that in mind when, especially in an environment like what we're in, at the, you know, after what, 12 years, the, the market, the U.S. stock market has done 16% compounded annual growth over the last 12 years. Okay, that's crazy. Um, so that's, that's what we see looking in the rear view mirror. Now, you know, as a result of that, a lot of people are going to be looking at the markets thinking, you know, all this can do is go up, right? I can't remember a time. Obviously, we have the recent March 2020 episode where the market did come down quite a bit. So maybe there's a little more prudence. But uh, if crazy things go on long enough, uh, you're going to see altered behavior that changes the environment. So keep an eye out for that. Adding value. It's our goal to do as well as the market when it does well and better than the market when it does poorly. Okay. At first blush, that may sound like a modest goal, but it's really quite ambitious. Um, so here's the matrix from uh, the most important thing. So aggressive investors versus defensive investors without skill. So for investors that don't have skill, um, aggressive investors gain a lot when the market goes up and lose a lot when the market goes down. Okay, it's basically a wash between uh, outperformance on the upside and down or poor performance when things aren't so great in the markets. Defensive investor, don't lose much when the market goes down, but don't gain much when the market goes up. All right, so both of these kind of balance each other out without skill. Uh, with skill, Aggressive investors gain a lot when the market goes up, but don't lose the same degree when the market goes down. Okay. Uh, and then defensive investor with skill don't lose much when the market goes down, but captures a fair bit of the gain when the market goes up. So this is where Howard Marks and Oak Tree are. Defensive, obviously they have skill based on their track record. Um, but these are, these are difficult things to do. OK, what you don't want to do is get so unreasonable that you think, you know, you can crush the market when it's going up and crush it when it's going down. OK, you probably can't do both. So it's better, you know, just to see that clearly and um, adjust your portfolio accordingly. Reasonable expectations. So this is going to wrap it up here. Uh, return expectations must be reasonable. Anything else will cause trouble, usually by taking on more risk than is perceived. All right. Uh, what's reasonable for uh, expectations of returns? Usually it's single digits, low double digits. Oof. That's not super inspiring. Uh, high teens are very special. Okay, if you look at the investors who have gotten high teen returns 
over 15 or more years, uh, it's, it's a pretty special group. Uh, more than high teens, 20% and higher for only the best professionals, okay? So, you know, these are some fairly straightforward, you know, figures that Howard Marks is laying out in terms of what we should expect as investors. Um, so, you know, make sure your expectations are reasonable, uh, lest you take on more risk than you actually think you're taking on. Uh, and, you know, I just finished it off with a, a congratulations um, and a, a, a bonus lesson uh, about Envy. Play by your inner scorecard, guys. That's uh, really the way to go. And that's something that Guy Spear and Monish Pabrai really picked up from Warren Buffett when they had lunch with him back in, I think it was 2007. So uh, anyway, guys, that's all I have. Let me know which of these uh, lessons really resonate most with you uh, and which one you need right now, okay? Because, you know, the market takes us a, a lot of different places as it unfolds. So I find a lot of these lessons really anchor me to uh, rational thinking and stepping back a little bit and um, thinking more clearly about what's happening in the markets, what's happening in my portfolio, what I should be focused on at any given time. So hope you enjoyed that. One of my favorite books. And uh, yeah, let me know if you want me to do another book like this in tweet format for each chapter. And if so, which book you'd like me to do next. Okay, let me know in the comments. With that, I will see you all in the next video. Take care.